Hello, my name is Mordred Viking, and I'd like to welcome you to this episode of Europa Universalis 4. We are in for something a little bit new here, because I've got my grubby little hands on a copy of Dharma, thanks to Paradox, so thank you for that one. Um, this is still a pre-release. The game itself releases on the 6th of September, but thankfully we have a bit of a uh, embargo before you guys, so we can get you some of the gameplay and show you what is up. Uh, the other thing is, I am actually right now in the Netherlands. So this is pre-recorded. I had to do this a couple of days before the embargo was actually lifted and this became available for you. So there is... I've, I've, I've left it set up as if it were still on Twitch. So all of my like usual Twitchy things are here, including me. Hello! Um, but obviously there's not going to be any live chat interactions. And at some point beyond this, probably episode 9 or 10 thereabouts, we will be switching back to the usual format where I stream it on Twitch and then chop it up and put it up on YouTube. I may also try and put this up as a pre-recorded thing on Twitch itself. This is not something I've done before, but I think there's going to be enough interest for people uh, to just, you know, check it out when it becomes available. I'll work out exactly how that works, if it's even possible. But yeah, we are here with Dharma, so the first question to answer would be, what exactly does this change? Well, I have a list of the condensed features here in front of me, and the are as follows. The one which I'm probably the most interested in, honestly, is the ability to design your own governments. So monarchies, republics, and theocracies, I believe, possibly also the tribals, I'm not sure about them, uh, have their own governments obviously but they now have uh, basically a modular system so as you progress through the game you'll be unlocking new reforms and then those reforms are a set of bonuses from which you can choose and then you can unlock these bonuses for that government so for example if you're a monarchy uh, you start off with just the the top tier of reforms that's basically going to be saying whether you're a despotic monarchy whether you're a feudal monarchy things like that uh, with like a manpower boost or a unrest boost or a stability boost, something. I'm not sure. We'll we'll find that out when we're actually playing. This is the first time I'm loading it up, so I don't know what any of the bonuses here are. This is just from playing or watching the Dev Clash and reading the Dev Diaries like a crazy maniac. Like, oh, give me more. So, yeah, um, as you progress through the reforms, you'll be able to unlock new bonuses for your government. So you can pick and choose which elements of... Um, which bonuses you want your government to adhere by. So, for example, one of the really cool ones for the theocracy, particularly if you're playing as the papacy, is the ability to make the pope into an actual general, which you couldn't used to do. And if you do that, then the pope, the battle pope, will actually have additional modifiers. I think he gets like a plus one to fire stat or something like that, um, which is kind of cool. And all of the unique government types, so the Dutch Republic, the British Parliament, the Prussian monarchy, etc., all have their own flavour reforms, which are unique to them. None of the others can take those. So the papacy one, being a great example, is obviously only available to the Pope. Um, and then this is true for the republics, for the theocracies, possibly for the tribals. I'm not sure about that. Um, the policies in the game have also been changed. Uh, quite a funny thing happened when I was at ParadoxCon in May. Uh, we were actually sat down with Jake during the media day, and he was like, okay, everyone in this room, who here uses any policies which are not military? And I'm like, me? I quite like the uh, naval game, so I use quite a few diplomatic policies like you don't count. Because apparently, from their stats masses of people, if they even use policies, only use military policies. They don't use any of the others. And that's, like I said, if you even use policies. There's a large user base which apparently just don't use policies whatsoever, which is a... I, I don't really know why, because policies are amazing. But they have completely rebalanced the policy system. Uh, so you will get the first three policies for free. You don't need to pay any monarch points in upkeep. So those are going to be for diplomatic, military, and admin. So you can get one of each for free. This is to encourage people to actually use policies of the different types other than military. And then you can have additional policies. You can get a total of nine of them uh, at the most. So three of each. Unless you're playing a Sweden, uh, which can actually get four of each category. So that's kind of Sweden, uh, Sweden's special ability almost, is they can get four policies rather than three. And then some countries will get the ability to have more than just the first three for free. They might get two admin for free, for example. Uh, those are all available in the national ideas now. Uh, the next thing in Dharma 
is it's obviously focusing a lot more on India. So I've been kind of hovering over India just to show you how much India itself has changed. And I myself am not going to be playing as India immediately. We're going to be playing as a European power who historically meddled quite heavily in India. And no, that's not England. There was another. Not Portugal either. Let you guess. Um, so we'll be playing as them. And one of the other features will come in uh, and you'll see why. But yes, India's had a pretty significant overhaul. Uh, a lot of the provinces have been chopped up, broken up. They've got the same treatment that Europe uh, has had. Um, so there's a lot more provinces going on here. India as a whole is a lot richer, but it's also split up between a lot more different powers. And many of these have their own idea groups. So we've got like Sindh, we've got Gujarati, we've got Gujarati princedoms rather than Gujarati uh, Sultanate, Baluchistan, Jampur, Bahmanis, Vijayanagar, and then also uh, Kandy and Kot in Ceylon here, uh, Bengal, etc. And then Orissa, who is kind of the Burgundy of India with all of their little vassals. They actually start with all of these guys kind of under their control. So there's a lot more going on in India, and my intention is to play in India for the community multiplayer. So if you're interested in playing in this, uh, head on over to my Discord, a link to which you can find in the description below, and we will be doing a community multiplayer game of this. You don't need to own Dharma. This is going to be a great opportunity for you to get involved with community games, but also to try out Dharma for yourself. And we will be playing in India. All players will be in India. If you lose your territories here, then we'll probably shift you out to Europe or something. Uh, probably as someone who has an opportunity to get involved again in India. So late game, we're going to see like this influx of the players who lost early game to get some revenge that that's my hope anyway um what else has changed well there are new indian mission trees for the big guys so like gujarat vijanagar bahmanis orissa uh Jampur probably now all of these guys have new mission trees and there'll be a bunch more of them as well making use of the rural britannia mission system the estates have been changed so with the free patch that goes alongside the dharma update all estates are now free they used to be a paid uh, feature in Cossacks. They're not anymore. They are now completely and utterly free and everyone can use them. However, if you want to use the Cossacks estate, you still need to have the Cossacks DLC to use it. Uh, the Cossacks estate apparently has itself been revamped. And I have a hair which is really annoying me. It's just like constantly dangling. It's why I'm doing that. Anyway, I seem to have caught it. Um, there are now new Indian estates as well. So, for example, caste system is implemented. So, Brahmins, Jain, uh, and I th just a complete overhaul of the estates. I haven't had a chance to play with that too much yet, so I don't know exactly how that has changed. And that is definitely one of the things I'm going to be curious about, particularly in the light of having played some Mio and Taxes, whose estate system is redonkulous. Uh, what else has changed? They have a, a Mughal culture bonus. So the Mughal Empire can be established here in India. I think it's any of the, like, the northern guys or maybe the ones who start out as Muslim rather than the Hindus. The Hindus can form Hindustan. Uh, but the Mughals have an ability where for every culture that they accept, they get like a bonus for their nation. I believe that's how it works. The Mughal Empire can assimilate and accommodate newly conquered cultures with ease. So it's definitely about like bringing together multiple groups of peoples into one uh, centralized whole. Uh, so that sounds kind of interesting. Then we've got the upgraded trade centers. So one of the things which I'm actually super hyped about. I just noticed they haven't actually included something here. Uh, where is that? Oh, yes, they have. I skipped over it. So, yeah, the um, trade centers. Centers of trade are now no longer just fixed. I don't think you can build them, but I'm not entirely sure on that. But you can upgrade them. So if you invest in a center of trade and want to make it a more powerful center of trade, you can do so, though it does get rather expensive to do it. Or you can just ignore it. If you're not bothered with trade, you just don't upgrade it. And every time that center of trade changes hands, so uh, I don't think it's just when it's occupied, but I think when it actually switches users, it will degrade by one level. Uh, tapping into a very similar system, we have the new trade companies, which are able to build structures in trade charter areas i think this is how it works this is where we're going to uh, explore so i'm going to be playing as someone in europe who is going to get involved in uh, india because i want to play with this new trade charter system and also trade company investments so no longer do you just go to say vijayanagar and say aha i'm going to attack you and take your coastline you can actually go to vijayanagar and say yo I want to buy two provinces of yours on the coastline. This is how much I'm going to pay you. And there's like an entire system around how that investment works. And apparently the AI uses it as well. So whereas the AI in the past didn't really do much abroad, except in like New World, uh, they will now get involved in India and actually like join the scramble for India. So that is really quite cool. 
uh, upgrade and right and then once you have a trade investment done you can upgrade structures within that area and that will actually boost everything in the entire province so india actually has a reason to sell these provinces to the foreigners because those boosts can be pretty potent it's much like having a merchant republic trading in the area um so yeah i'm i'm excited about that that's going to be interesting and then there are also many other things like new ways of suppressing rebellion monsoon season new uses oh new use for colonists i like this so once the map has started to fill up or if you have no eligible areas for your colonists to go to you can actually use the colonists to build up your own development in the homelands that is going to be modified by your development cost um modifier but it will allow you to use these colonists at home to build up development or you can send them abroad so that's like another reason to take expansion ideas i guess because it gives you that free colonist and then you can just use that to expand the development base of your home nation rather than actually trying to build colonies abroad if that's what you were uh, hoping to do so if you wanted expansion just to like take over india yeah you can do that and then use your colonists to build up wherever you are staying Right, so instead of letting this introduction waffle on for more than the 10 minutes which I've currently been going for, we're going to have a look at who we're going to be playing as. So, as many of you know, I am from the Netherlands. I am from Gelderland in particular, and Helra became a playable nation uh, in the Royal Britannia updates when they actually changed a bunch of the Low Countries. It wasn't just England and Scotland that got changed there, it was also the Low Countries, and that includes Helderland. So we are going to be playing as them. Uh, the Dutch were historically very active in India. They had the Oost Indische uh, Company, I don't think it was actually called Company, um, but it was definitely like the East India Company, but Dutch. And yeah, it was super rich. So we are going to be trying to recreate the uh, East India Company effectively, starting as Helderland rather than Holland. Um, as other people playing as the Netherlands do. And yes, we are going to be forming the Netherlands on the way. So I'm kind of excited about this. We're starting as another tiny little country on the outskirts of the HRE. I don't think we're actually a member of the HRE, but like the guys next to us, including the nation splitting us in half, we're actually a two-province minor, not a one-province. Uh, Clevs, I'm pretty sure that they are HRE. So it's going to be an interesting challenge. We start off with Duke Arnold van Eng Egmont. Uh, he is a 333, so eh, moderately okay, I guess. And the ideas are the tradition, so we start with these. Stability cost reduction, so changing stability is going to be cheaper. And also na naval maintenance modifier is going to be reduced, so we can maintain those heavy ships for cheaper. Until, of course, we take the Dutch ideas, in which case all of these are probably going to be scrapped. Though I might keep them. We'll see how we like them. Uh, we also have... Feudal Elevation, which is plus one Diplomats. I'll read the uh, flavor text when we actually get these in-game. So plus one Diplomats. Hanseatic Towns, we get plus ten Trade Efficiency, which is great, because we definitely want to become a trade power. Uh, defense of the Foreign Rule, Yearly Legitimacy plus one, uh, which would suggest that we should stay a monarchy. Yeah, I was kind of hoping that we'd become a republic, but we'll see about that. Uh, development cost minus ten percent, which is amazing. I like this idea. Um, so yeah, we'd probably do that. The uh, Helderland Wars gives us a morale of armies plus 10%, so our armies are just going to stay in the field for longer. We get a looting speed of plus 25%. This is one of the only Western powers that I have seen doing this. So actually going to war and occupying provinces simply to make money out of them is going to be a viable tactic for us. I mean, looting speed doesn't increase the amount you get, it just increases the speed of doing it. Uh, but it does mean that we can drain a province quicker, especially, I think, if we're using cavalry, who I think have a bonus to that. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. And then also diplomatic annexation costs. Because we're on the outskirts of the HRE and because there are so many small nations around us, having that is actually going to be really quite potent. Uh, plus it will free up a bunch of diplomatic points, which we can then use to, you know, improve the navy and get more trade and things like that. So it's an interesting combination. And then to cap it off, we have Tolerance of Heretics, uh, plus two. So if we are not all good, Reformed, Protestant, Anglican, whatever it is that we go with, Orthodox, Muslim, who knows, uh, then those who aren't of the true faith like us more. Right, so yes, let's do this. I am going to be playing on my usual options. Difficulty is normal. I'm turning off Lucky Nations. I don't like the system. Lucky Nations basically just give bonuses to certain countries and if you have it set to historical then those bonuses tend to go to england france spain they really don't need that help i like to see some of the underdogs sometimes winning for a change and turning off lucky nation seems to um, have that happen more often so i just find it makes a more dynamic and more interesting game based on what's happening in the game rather than historical context uh, that's just my choice though uh, otherwise we're playing with normal new world um no custom nation nothing like that everything else is just normal all right let's jump in I'm not doing Iron Man. I don't like it. I don't play for achievements. Cool. 
So we'll see what kind of situation we're in. We're definitely going to need to try and find a way of unifying our nation, uh, seeing as we're split in half. So we'll need to see exactly what uh, ways we have of doing that. Europe in 1444 is on the verge of the Age of Discovery, yet it is reeling from the shock of the failed crusade of Varna, as well as the threat of the Ottoman Empire in the east. The Treaty of Tours has left Western Europe with an uneasy truce, one that looks like it could break at any time, due to the ambition of the kings of France, England, or the Duke of Burgundy, who is like our neighbour. In the north, the Kalmar Union remains in place despite the disposition of its Pomeranian king by the Hanseatic League, as well as dissident Swedish and Danish nobles. The Russian states are starting to feel the Tatar yoke, as the Golden Horde continues to fracture ever since its crushing defeat at the hands of Timur. As the High Renaissance approaches, Italy and Germany remain fraught by the constant friction between the Emperor and the many autonomous princes. The entire continent is on the verge of major changes, and it will be up to you to lead the Kelleran Duchy through this period. We start out as Catholic. All of this stuff is fairly normal and standard. We start out as a monarchy. We'll see exactly what the reforms available are for that. Uh, one interesting note I should say about the reforms is if you make it all the way to the end of the reform, you can, at that point, choose to change from a monarchy to a republic or a theocracy, a theocracy to a monarchy or a republic, etc., etc., etc. And I think that's where also the tribals can choose to become a westernized government form. I almost said civilized. That's not necessarily true. A... Um, Actually, it probably is true. A civilized government form, or they can choose to become a horde, which is another interesting thing. So technically, you could have an Indian prince who does start as a tribal. There is at least one who does this, who could have elephants as their 100% unit ratio cavalry unit. So they would just be hordes of elephants, which I think would be kind of amusing to do at some point. And then we're in the environment. We're in Europe. We're in the HRE. This is all, again, pretty similar and yeah, they can do free imperial cities upon republics within the empire. Cool. So, we start with no diplomatic things. We are rivaled with Aachen, Hamburg, Cleves, and Liège. So yeah, Cleves is going to be the biggest problem for us at the start. They don't have any allies, but that's going to change in the first month in which we cannot declare war to get rid of one of the old uh, ways of doing things. So we are definitely going to go ahead and just rival Cleves just, just off the bat. Boom. Definitely want to see them dead. Uh, who else did we have? Hamburg. Hamburg tends to be a bit more of a powerful one and they'll be in the Lubeck trade node. Uh, sorry, trade league. So we don't want to go after Hamburg, I don't think. Uh, Liège. As soon as I remember where they are. Uh, I haven't played in Germany for a while. Liège is France, isn't it? Duh. Yeah, it's one of... They're, they're, okay, they're actually adjacent to us. Um, definitely a way of expanding, though they are not Dutch. Is Lone Dutch? Lone might be. Lone, are you Dutch? You're Flemish. And you're Wallonian, so they're Belgian. Okay, um, so we definitely want to take over Lone. Probably take over Liège as well. Um, so that is definitely an expansion route. The one I was really hoping that we could go after would be Utrecht. Utrecht really dislike us. If I can rival Utrecht, I'm going to do so because I want your stuff. Also, they're relatively wealthy. Uh, so we've got Clebs, we've got Utrecht. That's going to allow us to unify at least. I don't want to go after Brabant. Brabant is a powerful military... Oh, wait, they're... Yeah, the Burgundian. Never mind. So if we just take a quick look to see what Burgundy's got going on in this area. Hello, diplomatic map mode. Thank you. Um, so Liège is not part of Burgundy. That's interesting. Uh, however, all the stuff to our west is. Okay. Uh, we could also try to move into Friesland eventually. All right, so you're saying I do need to have three rivals. That is a little bit unfortunate. I think I'm going to make Liège the other one because Liège is another obvious place to expand into. So we're, we're going to ignore uh, Hamburg. We're going to ignore Aachen. Aachen is here. Actually, Aachen would be another place to expand into, but I'm fairly sure that, yeah, you're a free city. This is the seat of Charlemagne, so it probably is like the imp the imperial free city. Right, uh, armies. How is the military looking? Our military is a six of eight. We currently have a grand total of five infantry and one cavalry. I think we're going to go ahead and buy another cavalry and another infantry because I suspect we're going to want to go and kill some stuff soon. We have an advisor slot. Doubt we'll have the money for that, so we'll ignore it for now. 
Right, so this button, this is one of the new buttons. This is the government reform tab, where you can see all the things that our government can become. So you can see here really how the modular system works. We are a tier one. Our power structure choice right now is a feudal uh, nobility. So we get more money from uh, vassals and the nobility influence also goes up. So this is going to be the estates feeding into that. And we'll see exactly how that works now. Uh, we could also choose to be an autocracy instead. This will uh, change. Uh, uh, this will increase our corruption by 10. So when you first get a reform, you can choose a new tier for free. Well, for free. It will use up your reform points and you'll need to start uh, accruing them again. But you will be able to just get it for free. If you want to change a tier that you've already unlocked, you can do that. But that will cost you the 10 corruption. I don't know if you can just do it. Oh, yeah, you can do it at any time. That's interesting. Okay, good to know, good to know. I thought that would only be possible if you actually had a reform unlocked. But no, that apparently it just allows the next level. Reform points are generated depending on the power of autonomy in your nation. So if you have a lot of very autonomous states, you will gain reform points very slowly. But if you don't have very many autonomous states at all, then you will gain reform points quickly. So we are currently gaining 0.79 a month due to an average lo local autonomy of 5%. And I think the maximum you can get is 1 a month. So even 5% is hurting that quite a lot. So having autonomy is, yeah, it's going to be bad. I suspect that's because we have, no, we don't have any estates. We just have a autonomy of 10% in one province and 0% in the other. Okay, good to know. Uh, the next level is going to be noble privileges. We could choose to strengthen them, which will give a national manpower modifier of plus 15%. We can curtail them, which will give us another tax modifier of plus 10%. So this is basically going to be money versus manpower, although the curtail noble privileges will also decrease nobility influence by 10%, which could be useful. Okay, so estates. One thing that I know about estates is once their influence hits 100%, that's when the bad things happen. That's when the um, plutocratic coup, aristocratic coup, or clerical coup? I don't actually know what the clergy do at 100%. Uh, will kick off. So rather than it just being the weird 80%, uh, it's now 100%. So if it ever gets to that point, then yeah, that's when the bad stuff happens. Loyalty, I think, still normalizes towards 50%, though there are ways of modifying that, including reforms. And then also the interaction. So we still have the ask for contribution. That has not changed. It will cost 10 loyalty. And we can do it every 10 years. We can grant uh, charters, which give influence and loyalty. Diplomatic support, which is diplo, loses loyalty. Okay, these don't seem to have changed a huge amount. Um, also, states will no longer demand territory. So it is entirely up to you what you give to the estate and what you don't. So I'm kind of hoping that means that the modifiers that estates give are improved i'm not entirely sure how that's going to work exactly uh just doing a quick check here i don't think that these have changed at all either no it doesn't look like it what do we need to do the demand support we need 25 percent influence so giving land away is going to basically be a necessity for that and then the nobility have the increased influence because of monarchy and because of the feudal nobles so if we got rid of the feudal nobles that influence would go down to 25 and if we got rid of the curtail, we, uh, curtailed the nobles things, then that would go down to 15. So that's a good way of kind of using a lot of these abilities without worrying too much about the influence. So we can already demand military support there for the uh, power, and we can also call the Diet. I believe, actually I don't know what the levels will be. So the levels are loyalty above 60, then you get 10 manpower, 5 maintenance. If your loyalty is between 40 and 60, you get manpower recovery. So the land maintenance is like the advanced loyalty level. And if you have below 40% loyalty, then you suffer the penalties. doesn't say what the influence rankings are. Because it used to be the higher, higher your influence, the more... Or the higher the modifiers would become. Maybe that's still true, though it doesn't really look like it based on this. So I don't know what those um, tiers will be. We'll find that out when we're playing. Helra, do you have missions? You do not. But I'm sure once we become the Netherlands, then we shall, and we'll go through those. Policies. This is how the policy system works. So as you can see, you have the nine boxes. The first three that you choose will be free. Um, don't cost you anything. And then the ones after that will give you uh, or will cost you monarch points as per normal. So you can at most spend two uh, admin, two diplo, or two military, plus the three uh, free ones. Policies are still created in the same way. They are based on your ideas. 
So a policy is a combination of two ideas. So if you have innovative and espionage, for example, then you would have, and we can hover over the names here, you can see there the Espionage Act, which is innovative plus espionage ideas, would give us a stability modifier minus 25% and one diplomat. This whole set has completely, or rather the policy set, has completely changed. They have like revamped the whole thing. So what used to be good policies might not necessarily be good ones anymore. And that's definitely something we will be looking at as and when we're choosing our ideas. I don't want to do that too far ahead of time because idea choices also kind of depend what's going on in the game itself. They are not entirely policy dependent. Um, right. Money. We are making a surplus, which is great. And we've got an army. We're building some more troops. We'll still have a surplus when those troops are built because I think cavalry costs by five. Five, three. I was right. All right, awesome. Um, actually, looking at my timer, I think this is probably a good time to end this first episode. So sorry that I kind of waffled on at the beginning there. I thought it was important to go through exactly what Dharma introduces, especially as this is the first episode of this new Dharma series. So some of you may not have been following the developer diaries, so you get a better idea. But we will, of course, be going through as much of that stuff as possible when we're playing the game itself. Thank you, everyone, for watching. I do hope you've enjoyed this. If you have, be sure to hit that like button, or if you're on Twitch, hit that... Uh, follow button. If you've really enjoyed this, then do consider subscribing on Twitch or hitting my Patreon, which you can find in... Th wow, this is going to get long-winded. Hit the Patreon, which you can find in the description below. And if you wish to join the community in a more active way, then check out the uh, Discord again, the link to which you can find uh, in the description below. Uh, that is where I tend to announce what I am streaming and when. If you want to come hang out with me, I'm there very often. And obviously the community itself are there too, and they talk a lot about games, so it'd be great to see you guys. Uh, thank you everyone for watching. In the next one, we will unpause the game and actually get going. See you then.